Hello and welcome to the 124th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 11th of June 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. Today I'm delighted to speak with Paul and Ivan, the brains behind the Red Plateus YouTube channel. We discuss their excellent recent video on prefigurative politics and why this concept is so important for our revolutionary politics. Paul is the co-author of the recent book Prefigurative Politics Building Tomorrow Today. You can find links to their YouTube channel and where you can buy the book in the show notes. This episode was recorded a number of weeks ago before the recent outbreak of the BLM protests across the US. This week I have the new Patreons David Gitt, Jared Alford, Nigel Walker, Anne McShane, Andrew Burns and James DeFilippo to thank. If you liked today's episode and want to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month, you get two patron-only episodes every month, the regular episodes a few days early and the right to vote on the next reading group series. Your support really does make this show possible. Okay, to the interview. So guys, you have started a YouTube channel last year. What would you describe your YouTube channel as? I guess we're a YouTube channel that tries to go through certain aspects of socialist theory that we think are important and interesting in a clear, accessible, but still fairly sort of precise and rigorous way. We've started off mostly with explaining certain aspects of Marx that we think are important and that we don't think have been well covered elsewhere on the internet in general, but on YouTube in particular, and that also aren't often aren't very well known among various kinds of, sort of socialist activists and uh, and so on. So we our first series was on sort of human development, freedom, alienation, and communism. That is Marx's ideas about all of those things. And our next series is going to be on his theory of sort of human being, society, and social change. So his theory of praxis, his dialectical and historical materialism, his views on the transition from capitalism to communism, and so on. And in between that, we do certain like specialized videos on on debates or other ideas that we think are important, like how strikes work and why they're important, or on, for example, the debate about whether socialists should take state power. We also have a video on prefigurative politics, which is partly based on a book that I co-wrote and published recently. How would you describe your politics, guys, then? Because it strikes me as some kind of, would I be right in saying left calm? Or do you think your politics falls neatly into one of these annoying kind of titles? I don't know. We haven't really, like, in detail discussed our line. And I think it would be difficult to really say, at least for my part, whether I have a clear line, partly because... The main things I'm interested in are sort of concrete ideas as well as certain bits of theory. And I think that some of the simplistic labels we often use, like Marxist Leninist, like like left com, like council communist, like anarchist, like syndicalist, often sort of obfuscate more than they actually clarify. I think labels are often the opposite of understanding, which I'm pretty sure is a quote from a Valkowski series at some point. But I, I don't think there's a single label that's sort of quite anyone that I quite perfectly identify with. And I'm also not entirely settled on my ideas about about revolutionary strategy. Um, so broadly speaking, it's Marxist. Broadly speaking, it's revolutionary socialist in sort of the broadest possible senses of those terms. I think there are important ideas in various strands of Marxism and in particular in Marx's own work. And I think there are also some very useful ideas in various strands of anarchism and syndicalism. Yeah, I think we broadly have very similar politics it would seem to me that the Marxist critique of anarchists has got a lot of uh, legs and the anarchist critique of actually existing what ended up being called Marxist has got a lot of legs and there most likely needs to be some synthesis. That's where I personally come from. You recently released, let's get into the video that I watched, on prefigurative politics. It was really good. I, I really liked it. It was very, very clear. Okay, hit, hit us, guys. What do you think uh, prefigurative politics is give us a good clean definition there we thankfully have an expert (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah i guess i guess i literally wrote the book on that so i have a co-written book called prefigurative politics building tomorrow today uh 
if you like go into like a bookstore and search for prefigurative politics, it should come up because it's the only monograph on it so far. There are other books that sort of touch on it, but it's the only one sort of really dedicated to that question specifically. Although I do have a couple of friends who are going to have books coming out in, in a little while, so that's going to be great. I want to sort of start from a sort of brief reflection, right? I think when it comes to like major instances of historical change, whether they're sort of more slower kind of evolutions or more sort of fast and dramatic revolutions, one of the things I think we see, and I think many other socialists have, have thought about, is that these kinds of major social changes rarely invent sort of entirely new things uh, ex nihilo, so like out of nothing. Normally what they do is that they expand, they further develop, they differently apply, they generalize certain sort of social relations and practices that already exist and have been developed in some earlier form of society. So we see this, for example, in how uh, late classical slavery eventually sort of grew into feudalism. And we saw how when various countries transitioned to capitalism, some quite fast, others much more slowly, they draw on and generalized kind of capitalist social relations that had already existed in feudalism for some time. And like similarly, when we saw the transition to central planning, what in particular the Bolsheviks did, and were very conscious about doing, was taking certain kind of centrally organized institutions, among them the German post office, and sort of modeled much that they were doing on that, right? And generally, the techniques of central planning built on already existing practices that were developed by capitalist states and by capitalist uh, companies. And I think prefigurative politics can, especially in the modern sort of era, so the last sort of hundred-ish years, can be understood as basically learning this lesson and trying to take a conscious and deliberate approach to the politics of trying to do this. So often we think about prefigurative politics through the slogan, you know, building the new within the shell of the old. There are a few different definitions. The one we prefer in the book is the deliberate experimental implementation of desired future social relations and practices in the here and now. So in other words, the idea that we, if we want to reach certain kinds of future social relations and practices, then we need to start sort of implementing them, figuring them out, starting to use them and practice them already in the present society before we fully transition to the other one. That tends to be applied very broadly. And I just want to mention that it has like a sort of formal decision-making institutions aspect to it, namely how we or formally organized deliberation decision-making within large-scale organizations. But it also has a bunch of other aspects with respect to things like reconfiguring gender relations, combating racism within organizations and stuff like that. And you can adopt prefigurative politics in some of these without adopting them in, in others. Yeah, so, so when you say adopt them in some and not others, why... Oh yeah, so, so to be clear, I'm not saying it's a good idea to adopt them. I think in general, it's useful to adopt all of them, right? To try to address, like not only have prefigurative decision-making and deliberation institutions, but also try to, yeah, like I said, address questions of, for example, uh, sexism and racism within organizations of struggle and transition because you want them in a future society and because they're worth eliminating on their own terms and and sort of for their own sakes. My point is just merely historically. So a lot of, for example, syndicalist organizations, they talked about their formal decision-making structures in terms of, for example, before 1977, they didn't use the term prefigurative politics. They talked about the coherence between means and ends. But a lot of syndicalist organizations, they analyzed how they were organizing their formal decision-making institutions in terms of prefigurative politics, but they didn't necessarily do the same when they thought about uh, for example, combating racism and so on. Often they did that as well, but they often didn't think about and conceptualize it as a kind of explicit means and coherence. On the other side, there are, for example, sort of Marxist vanguard parties that take very seriously the need to combat sexism and misogyny within their organizations. Uh, of course, some don't, but the ones that do might do that, but they would still reject trying to prefigure the kinds of future more free, uh, less centralized decision-making institutions they want in full communism, and instead adopt a more centralized model for fighting for that in the present. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I was just, um, I recently just did an interview with uh, two guys from uh, a podcast. It's in our podcast network called General Intellect Unit. I don't know if you know them. They do a lot of stuff on planning and cybernetics and stuff like that. Here's a, here's a quote just to talk about, you were saying about the seeds of one society are found in the society beforehand. Here's one thing that Lenin said in May, May 1918. So this is very early after the revolution. Our task is to study the state capitalism of the Germans 
to spare no effort in copying it and not shrink from adopting dictatorial methods to hasten the copying of it. Our task is to hasten this copying even more than Peter hastened the copying of Western culture by barbarian Russia. And we must not hesitate to use barbarous methods in fighting barbarism. There's a quote for you. <laughs> I mean, Lenin has a way with words is all I'm going to say. Um, he really does. Yeah, like that's that's quite bad. But again, to what you're saying is there, like they literally are studying the state capitalism of Germans. That was their their model right from the get go, which does kind of make a lot of sense. But um, it seems like an obvious thing to me that h- how do you attract people to the cause of communism or revolutionary socialism or whatever label we want to give to it? How do we attract people to it if their experiences of the organisations that call themselves that in the here and now probably have less or maybe similar levels of freedom than existing bourgeois party forums. Yeah, I mean, you don't do it very effectively. That's the thing, right? In fact, I want to say that one of the main arguments for prefigurative politics is precisely that if we want people to really be motivated for certain kinds of fundamental social change, we can't just you know, try to convince people that their lives, our lives and society are a bit shit, because we know that already. We, in many cases, don't really need to be convinced about that. The thing we probably need to be convinced about is, first of all, that we can, in fact, fight and struggle and make society very significantly better in some way. And the second thing we need, I think, is some sort of an understanding, some sort of vision or conception that we can, in fact, live in meaningfully different ways, ways that are meaningfully more free, more equal, more democratic, and that these are much more enjoyable. There's a a really interesting kind of a natural experiment, though of course not strictly scientific, that a Japanese newspaper called, I think the Heimin newspaper, did during the early 1900s, when they had a bunch of sort of socialists write in to tell them how they and why they became socialists. And the sort of articles vary tremendously. Some of them were dictated by illiterate peasants or workers. Some of them were like a paragraph. Others were like, you know, long paragraph after paragraph. Some were just a couple of sentences. And roughly speaking, they come down to sort of two main groups, right? So one was experiences of sort of injustice, unfreedom, oppression, and sort of struggling against it. Uh, so one of them was experiences of essentially seeing and experiencing bad things. And the other one was having joined some, say, union f- to struggle for slightly better wages and conditions, seeing and experiencing the sort of internal structure of that new union as more free, more equal, and that leading them to want these kinds of relations with other people, these kinds of relations of deliberation and decision making in other aspects of their life as well. And of course, having seen it actually be applied on larger scales means that you can't really then turn around and tell them, oh, this is just impossible. It's contrary to human nature. This would suck anyways, because you'd just be in meetings all the time, because they've already lived this and they've already experienced it. They've seen that it's enjoyable. And they've seen that humans can, in fact, organize in these ways, and they've experienced them as being better and as being more enjoyable. So, yeah, one of the main sort of arguments for prefigurative politics, not the only one, one of the main ones is if we want to reach a sort of really future society, we need people that are really motivated to get us and to get from here to there. And one of the best ways of building this kind of motivation, these kinds of sort of drives of what Marx would call needs, is precisely by developing and getting real experiences of these new forms of life. Yeah, we're experiencing, you know, at the moment, the coronavirus and the dramatic drop in, not just not just output, but supply and demand. But it's interesting talking to some just regular, my neighbours here who are very far from Marxists like myself. They seem really quite content with a lower level of consumption than they would have probably been without experiencing it, say, a month ago. It it seems to be quite a similar thing that you need to have the experience of the feeling of the thing and the reality of it before. And it needs to become concrete for you before you'll um, go all in for that, whatever the hell it is. Yeah, I think I think that's sort of an interesting experience. Like, I I have the same one. Like, I realize I have most of the things I really like anyways, like a year or two supply of books and tea and... Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I have way too much of both of those things, but I'm not going to stop accumulating them realistically. Um, but and I, like, yeah. I miss a social. You're a tea life. capitalist. I've, 
I mean, a hoarder, I think, is more accurate. Like like a little sort of tea dragon <laughs> on its hoard of tea, and it's mine, and it's delicious. A hoarder, yeah. Um, although I do share with with uh, people who come over, which is is different than I think most classical dragons. But anyways, um, but yeah, like I don't miss most of the consumption stuff I'm doing without. I miss the human interaction. I miss the sort of broader social life. I miss activism. I miss going and doing things, you know. But I don't miss buying more stuff at all. But how is it for you, Ivan? Because like Norway is handling this a little bit differently. Uh, yeah, we we're on lockdown. I'm fortunate enough not to be on leave or permitted. I work from home, and I don't notice much of a difference aside from not being able to see as many people. But I'm uh, I just moved, so I I'm still in the process of getting curtains and stuff like that. So <laughs> not good. <laughs> so, so my my consumption is almost above average for me, even in lockdown. I just buy less beer outside. Yeah, I'm too old for beer now. My beer days are gone behind me. My my liver is <laughs> packed it in. The hangovers are too bad. Yeah, I miss it. So tell us about the paradox of self-emancipation. Okay, so it's the idea that you cannot really free yourself if you're not the kind of person who has the power and capacity to free yourself. And you can't really become that person if you don't engage in the kind of activity that lets you develop those powers. And if you're alienated, that means that you don't control your activity, your activity controls you so you don't develop the capacity to free yourself so you're stuck in a rut and this is where prefigurative politics come in right in order to develop the capacity you have to start somewhere and you have to actually develop those capacities which means that you should engage in the kind of activity that lets you develop as a person develop uh, as a social being develop as an activist the paradox of self-emancipation is the question and prefigurative politics is kind of an answer. Yeah, so like you mentioned in the video that as far back as the first international, was it the Dutch or the Belgians you were saying were talking about how the international itself was a prefiguration of the future society? So this idea has been around quite a long time, but we, we look to the left today I'm talking about the the dominant force of the left. It's entirely grafted itself onto the state, which seems to be that type of politics seems to be nearly diametrically opposed to prefigurative politics. Do you agree with that analysis? I want to say I partly agree with that analysis. So the federation you're referring to is specifically the Belgian section of the international. And a slightly interesting story of that is that the guy who often is responsible for talking about this fairly rapidly writes a pamphlet about it is Cesar de Pape. He eventually becomes pro-state participation and everything. So the history here is actually kind of weirdly complicated and it gets more complicated recently as well. But as a general sort of thing, most of, for example, orthodox second international Marxism, uh, which of course is where most of the social democratic parties we're familiar with comes from, essentially rejects prefigurative politics and really focuses on taking state power, largely through elections, and then using state power to transition to socialism. And as we know, that doesn't work, right? They do this and Never once do we get socialism, although we do get social democracy, which is at least some sort of an improvement. By contrast, the world's sort of anarchist and various strands of syndicalist movements typically reject state participation and reject being bound and controlled by a political party and do generally adopt ideas of prefigurative politics. So there is this sort of split that happens where state participation often goes together with rejecting prefigurative politics and vice versa. There are, however, a number of people, even within Second International Social Democracy, for example, within the German and Dutch Marxist movements, who do embrace what they talk about as means ends coherence in various ways. So there's versions of this in, of course, Rosa Luxemburg, in Anton Ponnekoek, in Hermann Horter, and various others. And of course, that's especially those who eventually split from German social democracy in and join the Third International and become part of the Communist Party of Germany and generally are people that are labeled, for example, counter-communists and left communists. 
So for a long time, there is this split between more sort of Marxist Leninist Stalinist approaches, as well as the sort of democratic approaches who reject prefigurative politics and emphasize state participation and takeover. And of course, the anarchist and syndicalist movements who go the other way. There are, however, and I think there's currently like sort of an increasing consensus that prefigurative politics of some sort is in fact necessary for a successful transition. So we see various strands of Marxism that will emphasize both taking state power on national levels and combining that with certain prefigurative approaches. Uh, so we see that, for example, in some strands of, of neo-Maoism, we see it very pronounced in what's called 21st century socialism. So the work of people like Istvan Mesarosh, uh, Marta Harnecker, Michael Leibowitz, etc., who advocate both taking over state power on the national level and using that to help fund, support, and help to enable and formalize prefigurative uh, local assemblies and assembly structures on the one hand, as well as a prefigurative social economy on the other, with the hopes that these kinds of prefigurative institutions will eventually grow and take over the economy and the sort of political functions currently held by capitalism and the state. We also see things like libertarian municipalism and democratic confederalism, which advocates taking state power on local or municipal levels, but not national levels, and combining this with a kind of regional-based approach to transition. And also there's like strands that people talk about prefigurative politics in certain Trotskyist groups, like in RS21. And of course, the anarchists and the syndicalists are still very much advocating prefigurative politics. So I actually think there's a growing consensus that some sort of prefigurative politics really is needed across various strands of active, meaningful socialism. But I think where some of the real debates lie is how to relate to the existing state. It seems to me that a lot of, uh, well, like even social Democrats like Hugo Chavez, well, that's what he called himself. I think I've heard a quote of his where he was like talking about himself and Castro. And he said, Castro is a communist, but I'm a social democrat. But he has like kind of prefigurative elements in the Venezuela society. I think they have communes of certain sorts where they have local community organizations. They get a certain amount of funds that they decide democratically how to spend the money uh, locally. But um I don't know. It seems like the idea of getting state power first to push prefigurative locally seems somewhat backwards. And also it would seem that unless it's international, the getting the state power is kind of a short term game because capitalism is crisis and you're going to have to manage the system. You've got a fallen rate of profit coming in to kick your ass every 20 years or something. So it seems that these directions towards in some places some thinking of prefiguration it's not done on the scale or maybe in the order that would lead to anything beyond something like chavismo where it will probably end up being crushed reasonably soon what do people think yeah so um I was kind of alluding to, to Chavez earlier. So Chavez, you'll recall that one of the early things he became famous for was trying to carry out a coup against the dictatorship in order to institute parliamentary democracy. And while in prison for that, I believe, he read a book by Istvan Mezarosh called Beyond Capital Towards the Theory of Transition. And later on, after being elected president, he asked Michael Leibowitz and Marta Harnecker to sit down and figure out how to apply Mazarish's ideas of transition to the Venezuelan context. And of course, Leibowitz and Harnecker were both involved with the Miranda Center in Venezuela that helped develop exactly those projects you talked about. And there are two sites in particular I want to emphasize. One is the so-called Bolivarian councils, which are these self-organized from the bottom-up local area councils. But they also emphasized create, on creating a social economy that's to some extent outside of the normal market economy, where you have, at least ideally, self-governed economic institutions, essentially kind of cooperatives run and controlled by workers themselves. Although it's more complicated than that, often they involve state managers and there's conflicts to do with that, which other people have written about that don't really think it's very interesting to go into here. So yeah, this is exactly some of those ideas we're talking about. I think it's hard to really get good information about Venezuela the last three-ish years or so. My Spanish isn't really good enough to go searching for it. And there's not too much good in English that I've been able to find recently. I think there's a general anarchist and syndicalist concern about this, as well as left communist concern about this, which is essentially what the effects of taking state power will have 
on the fairly small minority of representatives or, or party functionaries who take it. Namely, they argue that, look, if you put somebody at essentially at the top of a hierarchy, they're hanging out with a bunch of other upper class people. They're suddenly in a new position of greater power, wealth and privilege. And being in that position will tend to change the way you see the world and the way you think about yourself. So there's a famous Bakunin quote that goes something along the lines of, you know, put the most ardent anarchist on the throne of all the Russias. And within like a year or so, he will have become worse than the Tsar himself. And the idea is essentially a Marxian theory of praxis point, which is that social being significantly determines your nature and your consciousness. So the idea is you make somebody a capitalist, they will tend to very quickly start acting like any other capitalist. You put someone at the top of a state, they will very quickly start acting like any other state functionary and shift gradually towards justifying their own position, seeing their own power as important and valuable, not wanting to give up their relative power, wealth and privilege and so on. And thus over time end up counteracting any sort of real efforts towards greater freedom, equality and democracy for the people as a whole, because they their greater freedom, their greater equality, really greater significant democracy would undermine their newfound positions of power, wealth and privilege. We've recently done on the show a, a massive series on, I don't know if you're aware of, Mike McNair, his book on revolutionary strategy. Have you heard of this book? I mean, thanks to like your podcast, yes, but not, not otherwise. So the general idea of it for a political strategy would be to return to a kind of a neo kautskian position whereby you build up a large party that is essentially prefigurative in its nature. So its general assembly is the highest body and whatever. It's highly democratic and not just fake Leninist democratic. It's really democratic. And you build up a party which will not enter into government, won't take power until it gets its minimum program, as in the Communist Manifesto. But the whole thing is that you run as an opposition force to capital. So as a political strategy, that seems to me to make quite a lot of sense, but it has to be an international. So the strategy is that it has to be a continental bloc at a minimum. So you don't take power until most of the countries in Europe or South America or wherever can take power at the same go and, and push through. But it makes me wonder about the nature of these prefigurative things that we see in places like Venezuela or in, say, the Rojava region in Kurdistan, what effect they can have in the long term there. It seems quite likely to me that they will die out without any kind of international replication of some sort. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's this sort of traditional view that the revolution has to be international. Broadly speaking, that's been the position of lots of anarchism, lots of Marxism, lots of syndicalism. Although, interestingly, not advocates of so-called socialism in one country. But I'm not entirely sure about all of it, right? I think the revolution, as it were, is probably going to be a long-term project thing. It's not something that's likely to happen in any sort of one very quick moment. And with respect to approaches that don't emphasize taking state power, there have been relatively few of them in the last 50, 70-ish years, and there have been relatively few of them in the last 150 as well even. The ones that I am familiar with, none of them have sort of fizzled out. The ones I'm familiar with have largely been defeated militarily by overwhelming opposition. So let's see an example, large parts of the Ukraine being liberated during the Russian Revolution. Essentially, what happened is after defeating the White Armies, they went to have a meeting with the Bolsheviks and they tried to murder all the top leadership, surrounded them, betrayed them, attacked them and destroyed them. And of course, I think that's likely to have happened to anyone with a significantly smaller army just because the Red Army, under I believe Trotsky's leadership at the time, was was massive. And it's not clear to me that organizing differently would have particularly helped them be more effective. The Xinmin commune in what I believe is now Manchuria was, I believe, squeezed between the Japanese Empire on the one hand and the Kuomintang on the other. Uh, of course, the Spanish Revolution faced overwhelming opposition. They were blockaded. This sort of not well known. So officially, the sort of allies, the US, the UK, France, etc., were neutral in that war, but really they blockaded the Republican side, largely because the leadership was often very pro-fascist, because they disliked the socialist strain within the Republican side of the civil war, although not in the Republican parties themselves. And of course, fascist Franco and his forces, they had massive support both from the Italian and from the German fascists. And of course, there again, the anarchists chose to join in a sort of common front with the Republicans and with 
the Marxist-Leninist Stalinist Communist Party, and they chose to both join the government themselves, which is extremely controversial, and they were very harshly criticized for that, both from left Marxists for essentially joining the bourgeois state rather than setting up a distinct worker state, and they were criticized by, for example, Argentinian and Uruguayan anarcho-syndicalists for giving in to participating in state power rather than destroying the state outright when they allegedly could have. And of course, leaving the army in the hands of the existing state and essentially trusting their allies enabled the Communist Party on Stalin's order to betray the revolution and enable the victory of fascism in, in that particular civil war. So it doesn't seem to be the case that these sort of more, what you might call libertarian or less state-centered things fizzle out. The Zapatistas, they've been around for a couple of decades by now, and they also recently announced a rather major expansion which, of course, they announced after that happened because you don't want to announce these things before they happen so that, you know, the, the state can then, oh, thank you for giving us warning. We will now stop you from doing this thing you wanted to do. So it's not clear to me that they fizzle out usually. By contrast, most of the sort of efforts at taking state power, those have been tried extensively and have had significant success at taking over the state, like building organizations that are effective, taking over state power. And they've never actually gotten us away from capitalism long term so far. So all the social democratic parties have now just become standard neoliberal type parties. Uh, and of course, all the more state socialist approaches that we are familiar with, they all either have already transitioned back into capitalism, uh, like the Soviet Union. Or they are in the process of doing so, it seems like, more and more incorporating a mixed economy, attracting foreign investment, becoming fully part of the capitalist world market. And examples we see of that are, for example, China and Vietnam. I don't mean to say that they necessarily will fizzle out, but I mean the lack of an international basis for them means that they're either going to get defeated or going to exist in isolation. Just trying to hammer the importance for Marxists and revolutionary socialists, communists, whatever, the importance of the international element. You know, I think it's amazing that the Zapatistas have actually survived this long. I am surprised that they haven't been defeated yet. I, I think also, like, I think that most of the states that the Marxists managed to get their hands on probably would never have been able to survive. You know, like, it seems quite likely that Russia would have been, it was so backward that it could literally just be militarily defeated if they really wanted to. Anyway, I don't want to get into all that, you know, that's kind of historical materialism stuff. But No, um, no actually, so I think I understand your point better and I think I very much agree with you, right? Like I think one of the things that was key to the Zapatistas was in fact international solidarity with activists in the global north, especially in, in the US. Like a number of people went down there and just like the presence apparently of a North American in a village would help prevent much, much worse human rights abuses in many cases. Yeah, massacre or just beating loads of people up and abusing them and so on. And we also have other examples, right? Like the internal opposition to the Vietnam War in the US was probably very important in eventually, you know, helping US withdrawal, right? And of course, in the case of, of Russia, right, we have to remember that during the Russian Revolution, most of the capitalist powers kind of did something similar to what France and Germany did during the Paris Commune, which is pause their war to focus on the real enemy, namely the, the working, working class. class and yeah. their own or others is, right? So like the Russia was immediately attacked by like the US, by Britain, etc. And in many cases, one of the reasons why they withdrew was because they had problems securing the loyalty of their own forces. Like Britain withdrew its navy, I believe, largely because they were scared that their own sailors would mutiny against them because they so supported the Bolsheviks and generally the revolution as a whole. So I think this international aspect is actually key to many of these things surviving. Um, absolutely. Like uh, internationalism and prefiguration are both absolutely necessary prerequisites to anything, anything lasting be able to happen. I know we, we can say the Zapatista is still going, but has it really developed its, say, productivity? Like, is it still working under capitalist relations? It's still operating under like labor theory of value. It's not gone full communist, is it? I'm pretty certain it's not full communist, but I'm also pretty certain... At least you know what I mean? Like, so it, like, it couldn't possibly do it yet on its own. You know what I mean? It wouldn't have the resources it, it to get there. So there are a few different questions. So like, one question is, what are the social relations in the region, which is one thing. And another thing is, are they prevented by certain things like level of technology, level of development, in sort of a classical Marxist sense, from attaining, for example, communist relations. And I want to say two things there. So I don't think there's what Marx called the sort of final phase of communism, right, where everything is distributed according to need and so on. I don't think there is that there. The reports I've seen, 
do, however, say that there's no kind of straightforward capitalism, right? There's sort of local councils that govern most of the villages in a very significantly bottom-up way. There's very significant internal development, things like education, healthcare, etc. There's more sort of cooperatives and more worker self-management and so on, in some sense governed by local communities. Again, it is hard to get like super specific details, but the reports that exist also seem to tend towards it not being straightforwardly capitalist, but being a much more kind of socialist type system. We could sort of go into the whole what is a necessary level of development for enabling a transition to communism. Uh, I want to just make a brief point about Marx there, right? Because there's a standard interpretation, which is you have to have capitalism to develop the means of production. And mainly the way that's cashed out in second and some extent third international Marxism is to say you need to have developed full sort of industrial factory type production. And only then and after that can you possibly transition to communism. And I want to make the point that Marx explicitly rejects that in the letters to Vera Zazulic, right? So Zazulic writes to him and says, we can't possibly have communism in Russia. We need to first have this bourgeois and capitalist transition. Then only after that can we focus on anything else. And Marx sort of writes back to her saying, like, basically, nah, it's sufficient for capitalism to have developed the level of technology and develop this more advanced force of production. And so long as that has already been invented in at least one place, other places who have not yet gone through capitalism and have not fully industrialized can still transition into communism, ideally taking advantage of these things that have been invented and developed elsewhere, but not yet used in that particular place or in that particular society. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. Say, for example, if the German Revolution was successful in 1917, they could export and help with specialists and machinery and everything to Russia and allow them to maybe skip the capitalist phase in a perfect world. Let's go Let's go towards the decision-making structures there. Hit me with a few decision-making structures that you think are prefigurative. Like, before I was ever a Marxist, I was got involved with the, or maybe around the exact same time I started getting into Marx, I was involved in like the, loosely, not, not very heavily, in the Occupy movement here in London. And it really impressed me on some levels that it was very prefigurative. I remember thinking to myself, oh, look at it. It's got a library. It's got like a healthcare place. It's got food provision. There's a place where people sleep. There's a place where people learn and people like interact politically. And I was like, God, this is like a model for society. And I was quite impressed. But the one thing that I found that really didn't work was, which you mentioned, I think in the video, is consensus as a decision-making operator. I found that it was like optimally designed to enable records. Do you want to talk about some structures or things that you think are good designs for prefiguration um, in general, or maybe even specifically for certain things? I don't know. Yeah, sure. So I was also part of Occupy and part of certain radical student movements as well that tended to use consensus. Recently, especially in, and I want to say this is like more of a North American and something European issue as well. The idea of consensus decision making has been identified with prefiguration and with certain strands of anarchism. And it's been prevalent, like I said, in the global justice movement or the auto globalization movement, especially in the global north and in Occupy. And of course, for them, that's a way of prefiguring the future they want, because generally speaking, or at least many of the, the anarchists who are involved in those organizations or those movements, they want a future that is structured in a more sort of consensus decision making based way. Historically, it's not prevalent either among those strands of Marxists who endorse prefigurative politics, like it's just not big among, for example, 21st century socialists or among council communists. And it's also historically not at all prevalent in the anarchist or syndicalist movements. If anyone says otherwise, they just do not know what they're talking about. Historically, these movements have used direct voting on most things and a bunch of other tools that I'll very briefly go through, right? So they vary depending on the nature of the organization. So if you have paid officials. They should be paid a worker's wage, if anything. You make as many decisions as possible on sort of the lowest practicable levels. Higher level decisions are made by delegates sent from more local units or or industry-based units. All delegates who make these higher level decisions are elected. They are responsible to the people who send them on. That normally involves them being instantly recallable. So if you send a delegate to a higher level council or assembly of some sort and they don't do what you want, you can immediately take them away again. They are subject to imperative mandates, which means you tell them what they have to do. And if they don't, what they do becomes void and you have to do the whole goddamn thing over again. They are rotated as frequently as possible. So you don't end up in a situation where you send the same person every time 
And that's the only person who actually knows how to do this. So you're kind of stuck with them, even if they don't do what you want. And in fact, the rotation slightly accepted. These are all aspects of how the Paris Commune itself was organized and all things that Marx labels federalism in the uh, civil war in France and which he praises as the dictatorship of the proletariat of exactly the kind that he wants. And I want to emphasize it's the idea of a democratic dictatorship, a dictatorship so-called of the vast majority class, effectively dictating the terms of social transition in its own interests. And of course, yeah, these are the organizational forms that traditionally have been used in various ways and with slight modifications by the world's anarchist, syndicalist, and many, but not all kinds of sort of left Marxist organizations. They were typically not employed by most second or third international political parties. Um, Sorry, I, I have a question. I have a question for you there. Like, yeah. did the SPD in Germany, did they have prefiguration in their politics at all? I'd have to go back and look at all of their programs, right? I don't think there's anything there in the Gotha program. I don't think there's anything in the Erfurt program about it either. And the Erfurt program is the one that sort of lays the basis for subsequent organizing. There are many people within the German Social Democratic Party who do advocate kinds of prefigurative politics, right? So these are people like Rosa Luxemburg, there's people like Anton Pannekoek and Hermann Horter. But I don't think the party as a whole generally can be said to have to have advocated it. Uh, I'd have to look through like all their like official proclamations to see if I could find any fragments. You know, f- no, fair enough. Um, so one thing. Uh, uh, sorry, can can I just yeah. make two general things quickly yeah, first? Go on. I want to make two caveats about the organizational model I laid out because it's often misrepresented. So one, there's an idea that these things can scale. That's empirically false. People have organized in the hundreds of thousands, sometimes in the millions, in these ways, like the Argentinian Fora, Spanish CNT. Large parts of liberated Spain during the Spanish Revolution, Ukraine, large parts of Manchuria during the Shinmin Commune, etc., etc. There's also something I want to mention, which is this is a kind of like flat structure. It's not structurelessness. So, for example, like this sort of tyranny of structurelessness idea is a critique of organizations or sort of loose gatherings of people that don't have formal decision-making organizations. And by contrast, these all have formal decision-making mechanisms and institutions, right? They have a proposal, they debate it, they vote for it in certain ways, etc. I I was going to say one thing that people constantly talk about on some stuff that we've done earlier is this idea of secret ballot. One of the major ways that people in certain organizations that are, uh, inverted commas, democratic, when they have to vote publicly... They feel pressured into certain votes when they would like to go other ways. Is that something that figures much in prefigurative politics as a critique? I'm trying so off the top of my head to remember any specific debates about about secret ballots, but I can't I can't recall any right now. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it just seems it seems to me something additional. Another thing would be: um, is there much stuff on sortition as a way to get around some of the problems with delegation? In a way, I would be interested if there were, but in terms of organizing stuff in the present, there's not a huge amount of stuff on sortition in the anarchist, syndicalist and various Marxist movements that I'm familiar with. It would be interesting if there were, but there's not a huge amount that I can remember. There are people who talk about it, like Graeber, for example, talks a, a little bit about it. And of course, there are often parallels drawn to ancient Athens when people talk about prefigurative politics in various ways in particular is democracy, and you'd expect them to talk more about sortition because of the prevalence of sortition in the Athenian polis and the subsequent identification of... Uh, so this is sometimes overblown, actually, but clearly sortition played an important role in the Athenian democracy, and people have been aware of that subsequently. And you'd expect there to be much more discussion of it, but there isn't super much, really. But you'd, you'd think there would be, right? Yeah, look, it just seems to me that if you take bourgeois democracy and you look at the class of the representatives is completely different than the distribution of the class of the population. And it would seem to me that if we have socialist organisations, unless every single vote is flat, if there are efficiency reasons whereby not every decision is made at the lowest level, maybe there should be or maybe there shouldn't be, it would seem to me that the act of using representatives in those scenarios would lead to the same problems with bourgeois democracy, that maybe sortition could be an efficient way of getting towards not everybody having to do a uh, vote on every single thing. So I, I think in the Athenian polis, at least, one of the 
reasons why sortation was used, and also why a number of socialists want to use various forms of sortation in something like a future legal system is precisely because there are certain positions which they think involve some people having power over others. And the best way of dealing with that is to make sure that basically they're all switched around by loads of people so nobody can essentially sort of gather too much power out of that on their own. This idea that, you know, everyone rules and is ruled in turn. I think with most of the sort of anarchist, syndicalist and left Marxist organizations that I'm familiar with, they've less emphasized that and more emphasized that the power of decision making flows from the bottom up. So they wouldn't have positions at the top that have this kind of power to begin with. So, for example, if you mandate somebody, you basically tell them what to do and you make sure they do what you do consistently while they're sort of speaking for you and you get rid of them immediately. And, of course, you frequently rotate them so there's no single person who's always in this position. Then, at least, I think there's a general line of thought would be that you wouldn't be in a situation where you have somebody in a position where they can sort of accumulate this kind of power for themselves in a significant way. So you wouldn't need this sortition to essentially compensate for it or neutralize it periodically. I think that would be the idea anyway. So that is to not have offices of this particular kind to begin with. And when they rarely they have certain like specialized offices, often things like literacy, which languages you know can be quite important. So maybe they want to avoid it for those reasons. But again, this is something that isn't really much discussed, and it would be interesting to actually have those discussions. There was a really good line in your in the video. You said that you get to see oneself as an actor when historically one has been an observer. That seems to me to be a very deep critique that prefigurative politics makes of existing politics. Can you talk to that for a bit? Yeah, so to see oneself as an actor when historically one has been a silent observer is a fundamental break from the past. I believe we're quoting Marina Citrin there in a book on as Argentinian social movements. I think I think that feeds into something we discussed earlier, which is the effects of having certain experiences on what your goals are, on what your motivations are, on what your sort of ends are, and also what your kind of ideas and aspirations are, right? Because the experience of actually being empowered tends to lead you to see yourself as somebody with certain powers to act. There's a mistake that I think is very, very common in at least our society right now. I see there's a lot in American stuff, but I think it filters into a lot of the European stuff as well. There's this idea that everything that makes you kind of feel better or, or feel like you're slightly more powerful is really, in fact, empowering, right? So this confusion between feeling more powerful and actually being more powerful. Of course, it's a mistake. You can feel a lot more powerful, but not actually have any greater capacities to do or to achieve anything. But I do want to say that there is at least one way in which they are related, which is that if in theory you do have certain powers, like you could organize with others, like it's abstractly possible for you to organize with others and carry out a strike. But if you believe that that's impossible, it will be the case that you will never try it. So it's not something you are really able to do in a certain sense. And the experience of organizing in new ways with other people shows you not only like, are you able to do this, but you see in yourself and you're, it's shown to you that you can in fact do this. So now it's, you can actually then think about whether you want to do this in other aspects of your life and you know what to do to actually make that happen. And I think that's both an aspect of some motivation, because if you think certain things are possible, then you can be driven to actually do them and implement them. And it also says something about the ideas you have, right? It sort of develops your consciousness. You see yourself not only as someone who can sort of follow orders, do what you're told and show up and help out now and then, but somebody who can sort of really meaningfully change society in very major ways. And I think that's quite powerful. And I think that's quite important. It's interesting you're bringing up the stuff from Argentina because I, I heard Michael Albert talking about like the experience of the worker factories in Argentina, like post 2000 financial crisis, when some of the factories, there was a kind of an obscure law in Argentina that if the capitalists uh, didn't look after the factory or kind of left it to rot, the workers could take it over and run it for themselves. But one thing that they found out was that they were all extremely hyped for like worker control. But after like a few months when they interviewed them, how how they thought it was going on and they said that the same shit has started to come back. And this is like Michael Albert's critique for job complexes. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? 
I don't know, like that seems to me something that I, I think certainly that that would seem to be needed to be prefigured in our political activism if we wanted to also work in our social economic life under socialism. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And the idea that we need sort of balanced jobs in the future would then filter into an argument for in current organizations spreading around certain tasks and the competence associated with them to as many people within the organization as possible, especially the more empowering ones, balancing them out among all the membership, precisely to prevent there being sort of a de facto minority that, again, de facto runs the show, even if you have good formal democratic procedures. And that could be an argument not only for frequent rotation, but also for sortition, because that would definitely do a better job at spreading these competencies and these experiences around than uh, rotating people would, right? Just by virtue of how random it is. So I remember him writing about this uh, quite a while ago, actually. He tells a story about this one factory that he visited, which I think is a great story where like all their managers essentially left as well. Like they didn't have like an accountant or anything. So what they do is they get together and it's like, well, we need somebody, for example, to be the accountant. So that there's, I think, a middle-aged or older, like illiterate woman who like within like a year or two teaches herself to read, write, and do accounting, which tells you something about the incredible powers human beings actually have, and, and her in particular. And then within another year or two, she and like a few other people who essentially took over management functions, end up de facto running the show. Because if you have a formally democratic meeting, but you have, say, you know, say 100 members, but you have like three people who have like all the sort of key empowering knowledge and tasks, de facto, they're the only ones who are really qualified to have an opinion on loads of things. They're the ones with all the necessary information. And they can tell people sort of what they want. And de facto, they're the ones making the decisions for everyone else. Again, precisely because they're the ones in control of these positions. They have very limited knowledge. They have very limited sort of skills and competencies, etc. I think that's a good argument. I think it's a very good argument for the need for balancing jobs. And it actually connects to what something Marx writes from like the German ideology onwards of the need to abolish the division of labor, which of course doesn't mean an end to subdividing tasks, right? But it does mean an end to blocking people off into like very narrow spheres of activity within the workplace, but instead allowing people to organize in such a way that we share the tasks involved in a given workplace among us, not necessarily, again, in, in specifically in Michael Albert's view, doesn't require that everyone does everything or that all tasks are rotated, but it does mean that we all do sort of a balance of more and less empowering tasks, precisely to ensure that when we meet in our formerly democratic assembly, we all sort of have roughly the same amount of key task experience, key knowledge to contribute meaningfully to the debate and to the decision making so that we're all sort of genuinely part of this equal and, and free process of collective decision making. It seems like that there is this obvious short term, short sighted, a micro uh, advantage to having people utterly specialized versus like a macro advantage for society, everybody having like many skills. The examples of like the Soviet bloc or China or I assume Vietnam, North Korea, they don't seem to have done any of that. They're highly bureaucratic. OK, let me see another question. Let me see if I have any more. Oh, yeah. One thing you mentioned about was how to deal with you know problems of race, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, all, all that horrible stuff. You mentioned the concept of caucuses within the party to deal with this. Do you want to talk a little bit on that, Paul? Yeah. So, I mean, with respect to dealing with these questions, I don't think there's a one size fits all. It sort of all has to be tailored to the specific situations you're dealing with, the particular kind of organization, the particular context, etc. Which is a nice way of sort of copping out and saying, I'm not going to give you any details for how to do anything. <laughs> yeah. um, so what we yeah. do in the... But, <laughs> Damn you. But it's also true, right? Which is the thing. Like if your moat of the socialist reason is deeply contextual and they make this point, something working in one place doesn't necessarily mean it's the right approach to, to other places. Lenin himself says the revolution that was carried out in Russia isn't necessarily the only model to be applied everywhere else. Precisely because Lenin is very much aware that local context matters a huge amount. Which is also why even those kind of strands of Marxism, Leninism, that sort of want very much to include 
Lenin and Stalin and Mao and Ho Chi Minh, etc., they are typically very well aware that the particular people they idolize and the movements that they consider to be part of their history did very many different things, in part because they were dealing with very different local contextual conditions. So what we do in the book is, of course, we mention a few different ways that different organizations and movements have tried to address some of these questions. And one of them, as you rightly point out, is having specific caucuses for women and non-binary people uh, and for, for example, people of color to really look at what the organization is doing from that particular lens, that particular perspective, feed into organizational process and do a bunch of different things. And again, what exactly they do vary from organization to organization. But I think that's born out of the realization that just because your organization formally is committed to gender equality doesn't necessarily mean that nobody will be really misogynist and an asshole. And if you want to actually address these things competently in the present organization, just because it's good to have an organization and you'll have a stronger and a better organization that alienates way fewer people and is much better organized. If you have an organization that takes, for example, feminism very seriously in its practice, which is one aspect, and you will have an organization that's much better able to help work towards a non-sexist and non-misogynistic future society if the organization is already working on those questions and on those processes in the present. One of the ways of doing so is to have the people who experience particular forms of inequality or oppression in society to form their own caucuses and be able to figure out exactly which things in the organization are particular problems for them and drive the organization to make the changes that are needed to sort of work on these problems in an effective way. Because obviously, you know, a lot of like cis men aren't necessarily going to know a huge amount about how best to deal with their own sexism, for example. But a lot of women, non-binary people and trans people getting together and talking about it probably will have a much better understanding of the ways in which uh, sexism and misogyny operate within the organization and will be much better situated to come up with ways of addressing it effectively. Part of me was wondering, because I think it's pretty much spot on, but a part of me was wondering is that, you know, this kind of liberal politics of intersectionality, whereby it essentially balkanizes the working class into separate segments. In organizations, say socialist organizations, radical revolutionary organizations, has that caucus model led to a similar dynamic at all? Or what's the evidence in on it? Or is there evidence in? Yeah, so in the organizations that I'm familiar with, um, that doesn't seem to have been the case. A number of unions that have these kind of things hasn't impacted them broadly. There are sometimes big debates if you have an organization that wants to start implementing this and doing this. Then sometimes there are big debates and they can be quite heated. Uh, But once they're in place, I haven't seen any of those, what you call sort of balkanization effects actually happening. In all the cases I'm familiar with, the organizations seem to be functioning a lot better and more smoothly once they're in place and if they are able to actually function with the required degrees of autonomy and, and empowerment. So yeah, no, it generally, it seems to sort of work well. I mean, these questions and these issues aren't necessarily easy to address, much like all forms of radical politics, right? They do require some thinking and some organizing, and people will make mistakes and then have to try new things and figure things out step by step. But yeah, my limited experiences as a single person uh, with these things has been uniformly positive, actually. And also, the most of the cases I'm familiar with have, have functioned pretty well. I think there's sometimes a danger that... If liberals pick up radical terminology and radical ideas, they're obviously going to screw them up and turn them into something that works within their very limited and inadequate way of thinking about things in the world and and looking at everything in general. But that doesn't mean that these things themselves aren't valuable. It just means that if you have a bunch of liberals misunderstanding them, doing other things and using the same label and having certain effects that don't particularly, I mean, help to some extent, but don't can be counterproductive or unhelpful in other ways, doesn't mean that the original ideas don't function perfectly fine. There's this often thing that, you know, liberals pick up a word, they use it differently, there's also different practice with it, and then people just look at the label and it's like, well, this thing doesn't work, and they ignore the fact that it's used differently to refer to different things that function in very different ways in different contexts and used by very different groups of people. If they could mess it up, they would. Yeah. <laughs> 
A good example of this is identity politics, right? It was coined by this like radical socialist black feminist collective, right? Where it's tied explicitly to class struggle and working class self-emancipation, as well as specific struggles against racism and sexism, right? And that's a kind of intersectionality that many radicals, socialist, anarchist, Marxist, etc. groups practice to various extents and in some cases do it very well. But there are a number of different liberal meanings of intersectionality. And one of them is like a simplistic additive model where like there are different kinds of oppression. And if you just see how they overlap with each other, you can see how some people are more and less oppressed and they are all bad things. And you have a particular model of like oppression equals like, say, a particular kind of like prejudice or having less stuff or like being slightly more disadvantaged in terms of like effective opportunities. And then, you know, different kinds of things intersect in a very simplistic way whereby you just lap one over the other and then people are slightly more, slightly less oppressed depending on the overlaps they are subject to. Which is exactly the kind of thinking that the original idea of intersectionality was against. Is there anything else that we haven't discussed? I think there's one thing I was thinking about earlier when it came to what kind of Marxists or what kind of politics we identify with. And I think... Both of our experiences, at least from arguing online on my part, is that to a lot of people it seems to become a game of adopting identities of some kind. You're a Marxist-Leninist of this particular description or an anarchist, which means that you are entirely defined by being against this and this kind of anarchist, etc. And I think part of what we want to do with the channel is to avoid entering into the game, which sometimes it makes people suspicious because in saying that, I don't mean to say that we are objective observers staying outside of the, somehow transcending the debate, but it, it means that it's not really about that and we shouldn't put our energy into being left comes or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because people fall into a prefigured theory that they can just fall back on without really analyzing or seeing the flaws of their own ideas. And you have your team players and you know who you're for and you know who you're against. And it sort of makes it easy to start betting on your, on your favorite horse. And I think that's something we should really try to avoid. I concur. Breaking news, guys, I thought you might like to know this. Oil has dropped to below two dollars a barrel <laughs> wow oh, the price is coming and we're all gonna die hey, it's, it'll be fun to be in norway the next couple of years <laughs> it's dropped from, today it's dropped from 18 dollars today and it's gone to one dollar 92 now oh my last. god it reminds me of this this curse that i've heard of i'm not entirely sure if it exists or not but you know this all like may you be born in interesting times and yeah, time suddenly got interesting, you know? On this episode, you heard the team tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.